Today I'll be reading from John chapter 8, verses 48 through 59. The claims of Jesus about himself. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. The words of our Lord. Good morning. One look at the news this Christmas season, or basically any time of the year, will tell you that there is strife in the world. Russia and Ukraine are still at war, and nuclear weapons keep being mentioned, which is enough to send anyone into despair. And while America seems to be in flames with anger and division, much of the world's strife still centers around the Middle East, around a little city called Jerusalem, around Israel and Palestine, between Jew and Muslim, between Muslim and Christian, and it can all be traced back to one man who lived 4,000 years ago, Abraham. Abraham is the center of the three major monotheistic religions of the world. They are Judaism, because he is the father of Israel, Christianity, because he was the blessing to all the nations through his earthly offspring, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and Islam, because his son through Hagar, the servant, Ishmael, is the Muslim ideal of the favored son uh, in place of Isaac. The author of Hebrews, which we're going to be studying today, put Abraham in the hall of faith in chapter 11 for trusting God and being willing to sacrifice the son of the promise, Isaac, as a test of his covenant confirming faith. Now, I usually try to keep introductions short, but this one will be longer because when going to a new book, when we're preaching a passage from a book we haven't studied front to back, I want you to have some context before we go to the scripture passage. So today we're going to celebrate the Advent season by going to Hebrews and the New International Version Bible's uh, introduction calls Hebrews a masterful document. And I believe it. It is a master class in theology by a master of imagery and metaphor, Riken says. And it's all about the master and savior, Jesus Christ. We just don't know who this master is, this writer. Uh, it is most certainly not Paul. Uh, almost certainly not Paul, for numerous reasons, which we won't go into today, but it, it may be someone like Barnabas. Uh, it's, it's anonymous. And there is no way to know. What we do know is that Hebrews is the best explanation in the Bible of the Old and the New Covenant written to Jewish Christians. The Old Covenant was written to Jewish Christians who were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, who were under pressure to renounce 
their faith in Jesus, who, who ransomed captive Israel, we sing in our, our Christmas carol, and were tempted to return to the old covenant, to animal sacrifice, probably because of the very persecution Peter wrote to his churches about to stay the course which we just studied first and second Peter, stay the course, don't go back. And as did Paul. And he wrote of the two covenants, the author of Hebrews wrote of the two covenants and the differences between them and why the new covenant is better with better promises. Uh, better is in Hebrews 25 times. This is better. You, you know about new and improved. This covenant is new and improved. And just for proof, look at Deuteronomy 28. If you want to know what the old covenant was like, what the curses for disobedience, and then look at John 3.16, and you will see which covenant is better. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will have eternal life. And why Jesus is the better Moses. Moses delivered the Hebrews from slavery, to Egyptians. Jesus is the great high priest because he delivered us from slavery to sin. The new covenant is better. Jesus is better. Moses' brother Aaron was high priest and he died. Jesus lives forever as our great high priest. And there are three major monotheistic religions with three ways to be saved. We worship Jesus Christ because we believe there is only one hope for this world, and Jesus Christ is that hope. Christ is Lord, and he is the way and the truth and the life. Our life as Christians is hard, and it may be getting harder. But by looking at Abraham and Jesus through our study in this book of Hebrews, we will learn to stay the course but also to stay the course with hope. Hope is the key word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. We thank you for what you teach in, us in it, that we have a much better covenant. It is unconditional. Because you saved us, we are saved not because of what we do. It's not if we obey you, then we are blessed. We are blessed, then we obey you. So Father, teach us that this morning. Teach us that this Christmas season, that as we see Christmas cards with hope written all over them, that we would learn and love the only true hope for this world, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 6. <clears throat> chapter 6 and verses 13 through 15. I'm going to start with those. We're going to study 13 through 20. But listen to verses 13 through 15 to begin. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained that promise. Now that promise was kept when Jesus came. And the author of Hebrews was writing to Jewish Christians, to Jews, to Jews who knew the scriptures. And for them, the Bible was the Old Testament, which is everything before this. This was their Bible, the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament, which is what we're, we're speaking from today. He constantly went back to the Old Testament, this, this author of Hebrews. <clears throat> so we're going to do that too, uh, to find out just what that promise to Abraham was. And the first uh, thing we find is in Genesis 12. Genesis 12, the very first book in the Bible, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, tell us this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Hebrews is written to Jewish believers, as I said, and for Jews. And we cannot underestimate the importance of Abraham to the Jews. You need look only at John 8, 58 and 59, which Carol just read, to see how seriously they took their patriarch. When Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. He even said, ego eimi, which is Greek for I am. Now that's the name of God that he gave to Moses in Exodus. I am, the great I am. No wonder they went nuts. The very name of God in Greek. Jesus was there when that covenant with Abraham was made. He was there in Genesis 12. He was there in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, 17, and 18, when the covenant was cut, as they call it. Genesis 15, 17 says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. The covenant with God and Abram, later Abraham, performed by God, perhaps even by God the Son, Jesus, carrying the fire pot, created the nation of Israel, which survives to this day against all earthly odds. Next time you see a news story about Israel, and you will, think of how faithful God is. Because of the promise God made to Abraham, we see news stories about Israel each day that reflect that covenant 4,000 years ago and prove that God keeps his promises faithfully. They're still here. The Jews are still here. Pharaoh, Hitler, Arafat, among many others throughout history, have tried to annihilate them and, and remove them from the face of the earth. And here they are. Abraham. God promised Abraham. The covenant vow the author wrote about was a vow, an oath, as in marriage vows, in sickness and in health for as long as we both shall live. And you will be a great nation, and through you all the nations will be blessed. Those are promises. When we get married, we promise things to each other. Whether we keep those promises, it's up to us. We also have evidence that God honored his oath to Abraham in the very beginning of the gospel according to Matthew. Before the Christmas story is told in Matthew 1, Matthew 1, the whole gospel begins this way. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how important he is. And it goes on. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And it goes on and on to Jesus. God kept his promise to Abraham, and then he made a similar promise to David a thousand years later. David's promise of a covenant can be found in 2 Samuel 7.14. Now, we just finished 2 Samuel in our Wednesday night Bible study uh, with Carl. But way back in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, from uh, verse 12, Actually, yes, yeah, just verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. The kingdom will never be without his offspring on the throne. Now, short term, the son of the promise there was Solomon. But later, Jesus was the son of David. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem in Matthew 21, 9, what did they cry? Hosanna to the son of David. Praise to the son of David. Now, Abraham waited patiently. And that is a key point we might miss when we're in this world and saying, Jesus comes soon, how much worse is this world going to get? Are you coming today? Abraham waited patiently, and he was patient because he trusted the Lord to keep his promise, even though he did not know when. 
It really took 2,000 years until Messiah was born in a manger and the nations would be blessed through Jesus. But in Abraham's lifetime, Isaac was born and Abraham was patient because he was born when Abraham was 100 years old. And verse 14 reflects the confirmation to Abraham when he passed that test with Isaac. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. That verse 14 is quoting Genesis 22, 17. Abraham obtained the promise. He didn't reach out and grab it. He just, he got it by believing it. By believing the promise. Because God swore to it. We can hold him to it because of verses 16 through 18. Listen to 16 through 18. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. People say, I swear to God. They swear to something greater than them. But what does God say when he swears? He doesn't say, I swear to me. There is no one greater than him. He is unchangeable and cannot lie. His word is enough. Keeping promises with us is rare, but not unheard of. There is the famous story of C.S. Lewis, the author of Mere Christianity, of Screwtape Letters, and the Chronicles of Narnia, and his friend Paddy Moore. They made a vow in World War I when they were both soldiers that if one of them was killed and the other survived, the survivor would care for the single parent of the other. Paddy Moore uh, had a mother and, and C.S. Lewis had a father. They were single parents and uh, Paddy died. And Lewis cared for Mrs. Moore until she died in 1951. So that vow, that oath had consequences. And at any point, Lewis could have just said, ah, oh, it's way too much. I can't do this. It was rash. It was a rash oath. But he kept it. But because God keeps his promises, we can hold fast. The words are hold fast, grasp it even if it comes with a lifelong cost, like it did for Lewis. Seize it. When they arrested Jesus, it's the same word. They seized him. They grabbed hold of him. The author of Hebrews later said it one more time in chapter 10. And these verses in chapter 10 can be used as our takeaway this morning, along with verse 18, which says, hold fast to the hope. Hold fast to the hope this Christmas. And it comes with the added exhortation to gather together as the church as we are today. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We can only hold fast if we are certain that he will not let go of us. Amen. You know all about the trend from a few years ago. If you've ever been in a team building exercise with a corporation and they take you on a, a retreat and the trust exercise team building retreat, you, they use this as a bond where you fall backwards into the arms of someone behind you and you have to trust the other guy to catch you. That only works if the other guy isn't a jerk. There are a lot of jerks out there. If you are not absolutely certain that that guy can be trusted, don't go backwards. Just walk away. We have no reason to trust man, but we have no reason to walk away from God. Not one. Because of verses 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus had gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order 
of Melchizedek, our anchor, Jesus Christ, went behind the curtain. And this curtain was used in the temple on the Day of Atonement when, when the sins of the people were covered by the blood of animals for a year. They had to go back and do it the next year. And when that perfect, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was sacrificed on that last Passover, after that last supper, the Day of Atonement is today and yesterday and tomorrow until he comes again. Such was his power that when he died on that cross, that veil was torn, giving us access to the Father. No more priest, no more high priest, only the great high priest, once and for all, opened that curtain to us. He was the forerunner that went before us, just like the first soldiers to land on the beaches on D-Day in June of 1944 in World War II. They stormed those beaches, took that fire to make way for the rest of the army to invade Nazi territory. And one of those was my cousin, F.J. Boyer. I don't know what his first and middle name was, but he was killed in action in Germany a month after D-Day. But it was the forerunners, the ones that went in those pontoon boats that had 90% casualties to make the way for the rest of them. Now, the writer talks much more about Melchizedek in chapter 7, so we will not dwell on him except to say that Abraham dealt with Melchizedek in Genesis. So it brings us back to, to Abraham. And in Hebrews 7, 8 through 10, or 9 and 10, it says, One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, I read that just to illustrate how Levi was still in the covenant. It was because he was in Abraham. That is covenant talk. He was in Abraham because he was his offspring. We are in Christ because of the new covenant. So when he died on that cross, we were in him. And so that's why our sins are forgiven. The sacrifice was for our sins. We can be sure of it. There is no maybe or almost in the gospel. There isn't. Just look at the passage. There are no unambiguous words. Surely convincingly, unchangeable, purpose, guaranteed, oath, impossible, fast, sure, steadfast. This comes up in our daily Zoom prayer almost every day. Steadfast, anchor, forever, hope. Those are sure words. Imagine if the gospel was filled with ambiguous terminology. Maybe you'll be saved, because he was likely raised from the dead. But who knows, because God is moody. Christian life is kind of aimless, so buyer beware. God is loose with his promises, sort of drifting around. His love has a short shelf life. Feel free to wish you were saved, because you might be. Amen. No, that's not what the gospel is. If it was anything like that, I wouldn't be standing up here. I'd still be a truck driver. Because of the gospel, I can say this. You can be assured, certain that you are saved because of the steadfast love of Jesus Christ. First, you must believe he lived and died for your sins and that you sin like mad. And you need him to be saved. He guarantees that if you surrender to him and believe in him, you can be sure that you will be free. He will be your anchor in the storms of life. Isn't that a lot more comforting than maybe? Only by believing this gospel can we trust God like Abraham did. Willing to go up on the, the, the hill in Moriah with Isaac. David Allen, uh, who wrote a commentary, he wrote this. 
and I couldn't improve on it, so I'm just going to read it. He said this, First, God has made promises to believers that by their nature demand patient endurance to receive. Second, these promises provide us a secure ground of hope because of God's fidelity to his promise and his oath. Goes on. The author's purpose in using the Abraham and Isaac illustration is to demonstrate God's fidelity, his faithfulness, to his promises. Jesus, as high priest, has secured and guaranteed our promised salvation. His death on the cross, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement at the right hand of God as both high priest and king open the door of access for us to the throne of grace. That's perfectly said. Life is scary and uncertain, we know. We meet people uh, on our prayer walks. We meet people in the warming center that were just a paycheck away from being homeless, and then it happened. Many of you were in that situation. We lived paycheck to paycheck for many years, and it can be scary. When, and other things can be scary. Just think of physical harm. And physical insecurity, we don't know what's going to happen around the next turn in our car. When I was a teenager, I was a passenger in a Mustang on a rainy interstate. And Mustangs on rainy roads, you don't want to be in one. They like to go straight. They don't like to turn. It went into a spin. It was doing 85 miles an hour. And we came to rest in the grassy median, just shy of a bridge abutment with no ill effects. And we said, boy, aren't we lucky? But we weren't. God's love is sure. The uncertainty, though, felt like ours. And that, that can be our life sometimes when we don't know what's going to happen. And that's, that's true of, of pastors and preachers. I don't know how this is going. Anyone who has been in a boat on rough seas knows how good it feels to be safe on shore, to be anchored and safe. Jesus and these verses can help us through an uncertain and busy Christmas season by showing us why we celebrate Christmas because of the hope of the world that came to earth and was born in a manger to give hope to God's people. A few years ago, not long ago, Ray Pritchard wrote a book called An Anchor for the Soul. But I really like the subtitle, Help for the Present, Hope for the future. We need that. We need that this Christmas. Jesus is our very present help today in the stormy sea and our very present help and hope for the future, whatever that holds. This is because he was born in a manger, died on a cross, and rose again. It's the only reason we have hope. And because he lives. He is alive today. Therefore, the Lord's Supper, which we're about to celebrate, is an experience like no other in the, the other religions. Passover comes close. It's not complete. Ramadan, not even close. Communion, what we do with the Lord's Supper, is dinner with the king. Dinner at the king's banqueting table in the palace at the throne, in his throne room. Which one of us has any business being there? Not one of us. And yet here we are. We're allowed. We're allowed if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. So if that is not you, just let it pass. You don't need to take communion. But I love giving the first communion after someone is saved. And I'd love to give you your first communion someday. But today isn't that day. But if the Lord has spoken to you today, pray to him and find someone. Because witness what is going to happen here. We can only do this because we have hope. We have hope that when Jesus celebrated that last Passover and had that last supper, he was starting a new covenant, which includes anyone who believes in him. It's not if you do this, then you will be saved. It is, 
I have come to bring something new. And he saved the world. And if you believe it, you are saved. That's what he came to do in Luke 22 as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Have your elements ready. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat and be thankful. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink and be thankful. No matter how many times you have done this, there is just something amazing about the Lord's Supper. Just like how many times you have cried out to the Lord Jesus or prayed to the Lord Jesus, there is something about that name. That name has power. That's what differentiates Jesus from any other religion. You can talk to somebody on the street about anybody. Confucius, Buddha. You mentioned Jesus. You've got an interesting situation on your hands. That's why this is important, because this symbolizes and signifies our hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you, but to have communion with you and with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you that that no matter how often we do this, the first Sunday of the month or however often we do it, it is never irrelevant, boring, or repetitive. It is simply us worshiping and dining with the king of creation. Thank you that you stepped down into darkness to live with us, to teach us, and to eat and drink with us and you are coming back to bring us to yourself. Father, until that day, I pray that one person who, who has realized for the first time maybe that you are Lord and Savior and Master of the universe and that life in this world only makes sense through the lens of God and Jesus Christ, that they would surrender and say, you win, Lord. You are God. And I am not. I am a sinner and you are a savior. That goes perfectly together. Save someone today. And let us know about it so we can rejoice with them and with the angels in heaven. Father, you have done a great thing. May we all take advantage of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing one final song of praise to our God. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this 
Let's hear the benediction to our great God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.